ancient Egypt, so we're in period one for AP world history. So we've already talked about Mesopotamia, and I wanted to make a comparison first. We know that Mesopotamia was the oldest civilization, and Egypt comes in a close second, so it develops for many, many similar reasons. In fact, one of the major patterns we'll see in period one is that the earliest civilizations in world history all developed around fertile river valleys, so Egypt is no exception to that. So like the Tigris and Euphrates River in Mesopotamia, the Nile River Valley provided very rich and fertile soil for agricultural development in Egypt. Just like the Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia, the Nile River Valley was also prone to flooding. And before the Egyptians developed the technology to control the flooding, it could be very catastrophic. It could wipe away entire villages. But eventually, the ancient Egyptians were able to control the flooding and also develop canals, for example, that would actually widen the fertile plain. <clears throat> so the Egyptian Neolithic Revolution was slightly later than what we saw in Mesopotamia. Um, what we see is that in Mesopotamia, the people started to settle and develop permanent agriculture around 8,000 BCE, and we're experiencing a Neolithic revolution in Egypt that was around 6,000 or 5,000 BCE, so a little bit later. <clears throat> Again, like I said in the previous slide, the reason why agriculture develops here is because when the Nile River flooded, it would leave behind very, very rich soil, what we call silt, and this was incredibly good for farming. So the flood was a source of life as well as a source of catastrophe. The crops that were typically grown in ancient Egypt were very sustainable crops, uh, things that per things basically lots of carbohydrates, things like wheat and barley. Um, and also around this same time, in 5000 BCE or so, the Egyptians also started to domesticate animals. And then they also developed more technology. They started to mine copper, for example, and started to make jewelry and tools, which indicates that they will start to get into trade. And they also start to generate an agricultural surplus, which is one of the main contributors to permanent settlements, to the development of cities and more complex governments. The other thing that makes the Egyptians different from the Mesopotamians is that they also grow papyrus. So papyrus is actually going to be an improvement over um, the writing form that we saw with the Mesopotamians. As we know when we talked about cuneiform with the Mesopotamians, this was something that was carved into clay tablets, so it was actually quite heavy. Papyrus, on the other hand, which is sort of the ancestor to paper, is much lighter in weight, so it was much easier to carry around. And they also could use papyrus to uh, make other things like shoes, uh, rope, and so it was a, actually a much more useful and practical product. Uh, around 5000 BCE, uh, we also experienced some major climate change in this region. So what we will see is that the Sahara Desert actually is going to get bigger. There's going to be some declining rainfall across North Africa, which causes desertification. So what we see is that the Egyptian civilization is going to be centered around the Nile River Valley because they are surrounded by very barren land that isn't going to produce any food. The Egyptians are going to adapt to this climate change by digging irrigation canals, and this is going to help them spread floodwaters to a wider geographic area. I couldn't find any... Uh, oops. I couldn't find uh, any better artistic representation of this, so this is just a, you know, sort of a cartoon that is showing us uh, what the canals look like. There's also some suspicion that the Egyptians actually learned how to dig canals through the Sumerians, so that would suggest to us that they were training with one another. So we also know that the Egyptians learned some other technological knowledge like the wheel, the plow, and writing. And there is, again, a suspicion that they learned this information from the Sumerians, so that suggests that they were trading with them. But other historians and ar archaeologists also s are suspicious uh, that there might have been some independent development of these ideas. 
many people suggest that the wheel was actually invented simultaneously in different parts of the world. So whichever theory you subscribe to, what's important for us to realize is that the Egyptians have similar technology to the Sumerians. So we could speculate as to whether it's because they're in contact with one another or just because necessity is going to create similar inventions in different places. The Egyptians also developed some significant sailing technology. Now the Nile River is the only river in the world that actually flows from south to north. So what they could do if they were coming from Upper Egypt in the south, they actually could just go along with the current. But if they wanted to go from north to south, they actually developed sails to use the wind current to navigate upstream. Also, what we will see is that the geography and the climate surrounding the Egyptian civilization actually made it fairly easy to defend. One thing that made it easy to defend was that it was surrounded by desert, so it was difficult for invaders to be able to survive in areas that surrounded the Egyptian civilization. Additionally, it was difficult for invaders to approach them by water because the Nile River has many of what we call cataracts, which are essentially waterfalls. So it's very difficult for people to actually navigate up and down the rivers if they're not familiar with them. So like all early civilizations and like all civilizations in the future, political organization is one of the defining characteristics of a civilization. So let's talk about that in Egypt. Before Egypt organizes, it was divided into two kingdoms. We have the lower kingdom in the north and the upper kingdom in the south. Now the reason why they call it upper and lower, it may seem backwards to us because lower is actually north. It's because we're going along with the flow of the river. So since we're downstream on the Nile, this is why we call it Lower Egypt, and upstream we call it Upper. So it has nothing to do with north and south. Now in about 3000 BCE, we have a major event that takes place politically in Egypt. Uh, the king at the time, whose name was Menes, unites the Upper and Lower Kingdoms together. This represents a turning point in Egyptian history because we start to develop a much more complex and centralized government after this time. He also establishes a capital city in Memphis. So Memphis we can see here. So it's a little bit south of the present-day capital of Egypt in Cairo. But it's pretty significant in its location because it's fairly far downstream in the Nile, which makes it a very fertile place, and it also allows it to connect to the Mediterranean region for trade. Uh, Menes also establishes the first Egyptian dynasty. When, when Menes unites Upper and Lower Egypt, that effectively signals the start of the Old Kingdom. And we divide the Egyptian dynasties into three, the Old, the Middle, and the New Kingdom. So let's start by talking about the Old Kingdom. This starts a little after Menes, but we can say that he certainly sets up the Old Kingdom, and it lasts for about 500 years. Now, the Old Kingdom we describe as a theocracy, and we'll see this term in many other places in world history. A theocracy simply is a religious government. So there's really little distinction between religious leadership and political leadership. So the kings were actually priests as well. Um, we also see that the government was very centralized during this time. The king was in control not only of religious leadership, he also was in control of the economy, so he dictated the trade networks in Egypt, and he also was in charge of collecting taxes. Uh, he also supervised the building of infrastructure throughout the empire, so if they were to be a canal or a dam built or any sort of agricultural organization like a grain storehouse, which was essentially a place to store a surplus of food, was all controlled by the king. But just because it was a centralized government does not mean that there weren't other people that were helping in the process. So the king established what's called a bureaucracy. Now again, we're going to talk about bureaucracies in many other parts of world history, so this is not going to be a singular thing. A bureaucracy is basically a division of the government uh, to allow different sec sections of the government to specialize in a certain organization. Even the United States has a bureaucracy now. Right, so we have the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of the Treasury, that is a bureaucracy. 
In this case, the bureaucracy was not as complex, but it still served a similar purpose. So because Egypt was a fairly large empire, the king essentially appointed a series of more local or provincial officials, governors, for lack of a better word. And what these governors did was they essentially carried out the king's business in their respective regions. So some of these governors would collect taxes, they would also make sure that everyone was abiding by the law, and the pharaohs often, instead of paying these governors, would reward them with land. So what we're going to see is because the bureaucracy is going to grow as the kingdom does, the nobles are going to also grow in power. Also, because they get land and payment, they will often pass this down to their, to their heirs, to their sons. So what we start to see happen when the bureaucracy develops is that the no, nobility is going to be increasingly powerful. And this is actually going to contribute to the decline of the old kingdom because eventually the nobles are going to grow so powerful that they're going to challenge the authority of the pharaoh, which is going to result in some civil unrest and eventually civil war. Another reason why the old kingdom declines is because there was uh, some environmental problems. So there was a major drought and famine, which also weakens the pharaoh's power because he can no longer provide for all of his citizens. And so, again, when the old kingdom collapses, we're going to return to those two different Egypts, right? Upper and lower Egypt, again, are going to divide from one another. Now, just because the old kingdom declines does not mean that it doesn't make significant cultural achievements. The first pyramids were built under the old kingdom, and the pyramids were significant for religious and political reasons. They were established to serve as tombs for their kings, and kings use their authority in general to undertake expensive building projects like the pyramids. Why were the pyramids built? Well, uh, the Egyptians believed that pharaohs were living gods. And so when they died, they made major efforts to preserve their bodies to get them ready for the afterlife. They believed that if the bodies were not adequately preserved, then they could not enter the afterlife, which is why mummification was so significant. Now, the pyramids of Giza are probably the most famous pyramids. They are located west of the Nile River Valley. That location was intentional because they believed that there was a major connection between the pharaohs and the sun, and the pyramids were west of the Nile River Valley, which meant that they were located where the sun was setting. If we look at a cross-section of the Great Pyramids, also we'll see some interesting characteristics. One of the elements of the pyramids that has been a mystery for a long period of time, sorry about that, is that there are more, there's more than one ch burial chamber. So in the Great Pyramid, the cross-section reveals to us that the king's chamber was located in the center, which is where the sarcophagus would be located. There was the queen's chamber as well. But then there was also another chamber, a subterranean chamber. So some archaeologists actually suspect that this was a false chamber that was meant to distract tomb raiders so that they wouldn't actually uncover the pharaoh's actual tomb, which had very valuable items inside. Other archaeologists speculate that the pharaoh originally intended to be buried in this chamber, but then later changed his mind. And as you can see here, the pharaohs were buried with very elaborate riches, gold, uh, oftentimes their servants or their wives were buried with them, even if they were still alive. They could be buried with pets. And this signifies to us their wealth and also the major belief in the afterlife. Again, like I said before, mummification is also a very important part of the burial process. Mummification essentially halted the process of decomposition because they removed the internal organs of the person being mummified, and they would place them in jars that were called canopic jars. They also, you can see here, they remove the brain of the person being mummified. They liquefy it first, and then they use a hook to bring it out through the nose. Sounds kind of gross, huh? And what we see here is that in a sarcophagus, the mummified body of the person buried is remarkably well-preserved, sometimes so well-preserved that they still have skin and they still have hair on their head. What I'll do is, in the description of this video, I'm going to give you a link to a video that gives you a more detailed look at the mummification process. So, the Middle Kingdom. 
This uh, started about 100 years after the decline of the Old Kingdom, which indicates to us that there was about a 100-year period of instability and civil war when the Old Kingdom declined. The Middle Kingdom was founded by the pharaoh Menuhotep, and he moved the capital of the Middle Kingdom to Thebes, which was farther south on the Nile. Remember that the capital was Memphis in the Old Kingdom. We're going to go a little bit farther south to Thebes here. Um, additionally, Egypt again reunited under a central government. Remember that the Old Kingdom and, or my apologies, the Upper Kingdom and the Lower Kingdom were again split when the Old Kingdom divided. Egypt again is going to be just one kingdom under, under the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom also marked military expansion. We're going to see the purple part of this map here was the Old Kingdom's borders. The orange part of the map is the Middle Kingdom's border. So they start to expand farther south, and they even start to conquer some land on the Sinai Peninsula. They also move south into Nubia here. Uh, the economic development and infrastructure of the Middle Kingdom also is significant because the pharaohs, just like they did in the Old Kingdom, are going to order the construction of major irrigation projects, which makes the Egyptian farmland bigger. Again, remember that they help build canals which allow water from the Nile River to reach farther out to the east and west. And additionally, as we know, the Old Kingdom was declining because the provincial governors or the nobility were gaining power. What we see under the Middle Kingdom is that the pharaoh gains power back at the expense of the provincial governors. In terms of the, uh, in terms of the art and architecture of the of the Middle Kingdom, what we're going to see, and, uh, and also just in the arts in general, is that there is a major connection between the artistic and architectural accomplishments of the Middle Kingdom and the Pharaoh's power and the way the Pharaoh wanted to see himself. Oftentimes in artistic and architectural renderings, the Pharaoh had himself depicted as caring and a wise protector of the people. We see here this is a block statue. What's interesting about this is there's no space between the pharaoh and the throne that he's sitting on. This is symbolic because this suggests the idea that the pharaoh and the throne are united. We also are going to see that in the Middle Kingdom there are many temples that were built to the gods. Um, other pyramids are built and there are also going to be divine temples that are built. These are the remains of the Medinet Mahdi, which was a very significant temple in the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom declines because it was invaded by outsiders. The most significant outside invaders were people called the Hyksos. They were a pastoral and nomadic people from what is now Syria. And the Hyksos were able to successfully defeat the Egyptians because they had superior military technology. They had horse-drawn chariots and they also had improved bows and arrows. Uh, so despite the fact that they did not have a centralized government like the Egyptians, they're able actually to conquer them. But what's interesting is eventually the Egyptians are going to adapt the very technology that the Hyksos used to defeat them, which will eventually make their empire more powerful. The New Kingdom. So uh, again, about, actually there's more like a 200 year period of instability once the Hyksos defeat the Middle Kingdom. But they are successfully going to be able to drive the Hyksos out of Egypt because they start to adapt the very battle technology that the Hyksos used to defeat the Egyptians at the end of the Middle Kingdom. The New Kingdom sees again military expansion. I put this map back up here so you can see that with the New Kingdom they expand even farther south into Nubia and they also are able to conquer the rest of the Sinai Peninsula and then they start to move further north into the west bank of the Mediterranean Sea. They also are taking up parts of Syria, and they're even moving into the uh, sort of the northern reaches of the Mediterranean Sea, getting close to Europe. So, um, the other interesting characteristic of the New Kingdom is that we actually have a female pharaoh rule at one point, she comes to power in 1480 BCE. Her name was Hatshepsut. She was the first female pharaoh. Now, she ruled partly because her husband died and her young son 
Tutmos was too young to be pharaoh. So she started out as a queen regent, but then she effectively became pharaoh. But what's interesting, though, is that Hatshepsut, despite the fact that she was a queen, actually tried to identify as male so that people would take her seriously. So you see here that Hatshepsut actually has a fake beard on so that she looks like a man. Um, she dies under mysterious circumstances. Many people believe that her stepson, Tutmos, who becomes the next pharaoh, actually had her killed. And when Tutmos takes her place, he creates a large army and he expands the size of the new kingdom. And we saw that expansion in this map here. He conquers Syria and then expands the Egyptian empire further. And uh, what we also are going to see is that the empire becomes quite rich because it occupies such a large area. It has access to a wide range of natural resources, including wood and bronze, which were some of the most popular materials to create military and agricultural technology. So here we see a series of weapons, and then here, this is just a diagram of them, things like mallets, uh, things like plows, things like sickles, and here are pictures of actual artifacts that were found. This allows the Egyptians to improve their agricultural technology. Okay. Um, the New Kingdom also experiences a change in religion. In 1370 BCE, the pharaoh at the time, whose name was Akhenaten, actually attempts to make the Egyptian religion monotheistic, which was a major change because the Egyptians were polytheistic, and we'll have more on that later. What he tries to do is get the Egyptians to worship only one god. The god that he wanted them to worship was named Aten. He was the sun god. Now, this change would have dramatically altered the role of priest in society because the priests opposed worshiping just one god. So if they got, if, if Akhenaten got his way, the priests would decline in power and the pharaoh would gain even more power. So Akhenaten, not surprisingly, is going to struggle with priests who are trying to make him less powerful. When Akhenaten dies, we're going to see that Egypt restores its old religion and the priests restore their power and King Tut replaces him. King Tut was not that significant of a pharaoh. He only really has um, more significance because his tomb uh, was so well preserved. The new kingdom also has a, probably one of the most significant rulers was Ramses II, who was also called Ramses the Great. One of his most significant accomplishments was that he expanded the empire of Egypt even further. And so at the height of the uh, new kingdom, we actually see it expanding basically into southern Europe. He also built major architectural achievements, large statues of himself, like the Ramesseum, which we see here. He also builds pylons. These are major, major statues that stand outside of temples. This, these are pylons. And in addition, he, um, he fathered more than 100 children and had many wives. Uh, so he is a symbol of the height of the power of the new kingdom. Now, the empire, though, grew to the point, it grew so large that it started to become a target for invaders, especially because it had so many rich resources. So the Hittites, who had, made, who had very powerful weapons that were made out of iron, uh, actually are going to start to invade the Egyptian empire, along with other invaders. So that's going to contribute to the decline. All right, so like I just said, there's going to be a series of outside invasions of the New Kingdom. The Hittites are going to be the most significant invaders. We see that the Hittites are actually coming from, here's a map of the Hittites as well. They're coming from what is now Turkey, and they're going to push in, and eventually they're going to take over Egypt. Um, additionally, we have Libyans, Kushites. So Libyans are coming from the west. The Kushites were coming from the south. The Assyrians, the Persians and eventually the Macedonians or the Greeks. That's going to be under Alexander the Great, who's going to rule Egypt for a period of time. And then after that, the Romans. Also, before the outside invasions take over all of Egypt, when Ramses dies, the subsequent rulers are much weaker than he was. So just like we saw at the very beginning, Egypt again is going to be split into two kingdoms. And once it declines, what's interesting is that Egypt is actually going to be ruled by outsiders continuously until the 20th century. So uh, Egypt is uh, never going to really return to its former glory. And again, like I was saying before, Egypt was ruled by outsiders. Uh, probably the most famous of these outsiders was Alexander the Great, who drove the Persians out of Egypt in 332 BC.
All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more generally about the culture and society of ancient Egypt in a future video. So stay tuned for that, and thanks.